Um, thanks for coming out tonight on a wet and gloomy night. Um, my name is Nancy Reese, and I'm the division director of University Studies uh, and the organizer of uh, tonight's panel, which has uh, five wonderful Colgate faculty colleagues talking about how to oppose the return of fascism. On October 27, a 46-year-old man named Robert Gregory Bowers entered the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, shouting, all Jews must die, and opening fire with an AR-15 assault rifle, killing 11 people and injuring others. That was a bit more than two weeks ago. A couple days after that happened, as most of you know, if you've read this story, Colgate was targeted in It's Okay to Be White trolling campaign in last week's Murmur News. People who arrived early on campus, like very early, um, B&G staff uh, who take care of our buildings, and several very early rising, hardworking faculty arrived to find the bulletin boards of our campus uh, in many buildings plastered with these okay to be white posters. They were evidently everywhere. I got here a little after they had been taken down in the building that I was working in that day. Uh, as far as I know, uh, campus safety, the custodian who found them in one building, uh, notified his supervisor in B&G, and uh, they notified campus safety, and custodians around campus were uh, asked to please remove these unauthorized, un un sorry, unauthorized, unattributed posters from the bulletin board, bulletin boards. The uh, newspaper story explains this really well. I quickly ended up in a series of phone conversations with Dean Tracy Hux and President Brian Casey and several other people, Christopher Wells, um, mainly because I think, well, I notified some colleagues in SOAN. We always share things like this when they happen because we, we write and teach about, uh, about white supremacy and about fascism and about social movements like that. Um, so I notified my colleagues and, and uh, quickly became clear that uh, it would be a really good idea to, um, to do something in response to this campaign. Uh, it's, it was on Halloween night, the night between Halloween and the next day, so, so, no, so October 31 to November 1 night. Uh, if you go online and read about this campaign, it's a global campaign. It's several years old, maybe more than that. It's been happening all over the world, targeting, uh, mostly targeting universities, but not only universities. And if you read about this campaign, what you understand is that it is a, uh, a part of a transnational movement to try to stimulate racial conflicts on campuses, to try to provoke people who may misunderstand the message and intent of this poster. Uh, I don't want to talk about it at length, but the, the Maroon News article does a pretty good job of contextualizing it, explaining where this campaign comes from um, and who it targets and why it's really important not to fall into the trap not to respond in the ways that the people running this campaign want us to respond. Um, that event happening so soon after the Tree of Life synagogue massacre, and of course the bombing campaign that ended up fortunately injuring nobody, but, but could have injured several former presidents and other public officials and leaders, um, spurs us to really think uh, about what's going on. And so this panel b begins with the premise that something very significant is going on in the United States and the larger world. It's transnational, it's global, it's happening in many, many places in the world, as my colleagues tonight will uh, explain. It's also, as the, uh, as, as the campaign described in the Maroon story makes clear, it's something that can come very close to us here where we live. 
it's not just out there, it's not just in Washington, it's not just in Pittsburgh. Um, it's, it can happen, it can come very close, it can, it can enter our community, and it can have impacts, it probably does have impacts on our community. So the scholars here and many other scholars who responded to emails I sent on November 1st, uh, and you'll hear from them later in the semester and in the spring, many colleagues actually wanted to play a role in addressing with each other and with with our students, with our colleagues, with our community, um, what this kind of movement is, what it means, what it does, how it operates, what its tropes and memes are, and what it's trying to accomplish. This panel begins by with the assumption that this is something serious, something real, something massive in scale, something that holds the capacity for the furthest extremes of violence, the capacity, as history shows us very well, for genocidal violence, fascism. Scholars who study fascism, historians, philosophers, political scientists, political theorists, psychologists, linguists, and many others are sounding warning bells day after day after day. If you go on the media, if you go, go on the internet and, and look for these warning bells, you'll find them everywhere. And they're coming out of the mouths of the world's most important scholars of historical fascism. I urge you all, as my colleagues will, to listen. How well are people in the United States and in the world listening? How well are people on our own campus listening? Our goal tonight is to help create the grounds for some pretty serious listening to contemporary fascism. Fascism is not merely an extreme point on a continuum of normal politics. And I think the message that will come through strongly in what my colleagues tonight have to say is that fascism is not normal. It's not merely the furthest extreme on an extreme of white, <coughs> white supremacist, anti-Semitist politics. It's something beyond the extreme. It's a rupture from the extreme. And I think that the things we have to tell you today will give you good examples of that. Um, the scholars assembled on tonight's panel, panel are eminently qualified to do this. They study the histories of fascism in many parts of the world. They study militarism, war, violence, mass killing, assassination, authoritarianism, totalitarianism, mafias, militias, and other violent formations and organizations. They study race and racism. They study political theory and philosophy. They study the power of the media and the power of mass delusion. So without further ado, and I'm not going to introduce them individually in the, uh, in the name of giving them more time to speak. So um, first up is uh, Jonathan Hislop from Sociology and African Studies. Thank you. Uh, democratic societies today have a fascist problem. Now, when I throw out a statement like that, you may well think I'm simply making some sort of slur to everybody who happens to be to the right of my own views, um, or that I'm exaggerating, or that I'm making some sort of connection to the past which isn't really real. Um, but uh, the, the question of... of Fascism is certainly not just a question of uh, extended conservatism. I, I have great respect, believe it or not, for serious conservative uh, political thought. I'm happy to read Edmund Burke any day of the week. I um, uh, am happy to discuss with conservatives what the correct um, amount of state intervention is. Um, but fascism is in some ways a rupture with all kinds of normal politics, including conservatism. Um, it's a position that calls for a complete rupture with democratic institutions and practices, uh, that calls for a rejection of the essential democratic premise of human equality, for the abandonment of debate and knowledge in favour of leaders' intuition, and for force 
as a preferred political means rather than a last resort. So I'm also talking about views which are linked through chains of political and intellectual connections to the dark depths of the 1920s and 1930s. There are real historical continuities. I'm not being alarmist because these kinds of ideas are no longer confined to the margins of society. They're present in well-organized hardcore hate groups, in large-scale online networks, um, in populist political parties which supposedly have a new politics which, which are steered by hardcore ideologues and by the infiltration of proponents of fascist ideas into the hearts of mainstream political parties. And I want to make four quick main points about the fascist phenomenon and then um, look briefly, if I have time, at a case study of an attempt to counter it. The first thing I want to say is that one of the things which I think has helped to open up a space for this politics is the forgetting of history. Tony Jewett, in his wonderful book about post-war Europe, makes the point that a whole modern European political history since 1945 is overshadowed by the Second World War and the Holocaust and is about a response to it. And, and I think you can say the same about the democratic world more, more generally. And in many ways, for all the horrors that produced it, that response was a positive one. The generation that confronted fascism in the World War, and some of them who earlier had fought fascism in their neighborhoods and factories and streets, had strong ideas of what they were fighting against. Um, they'd seen the alternative to democracy and they didn't like it. Um, and the great achievements, I think, of the post-war period, for all their contradictions, spread of democratic governance, the growth of the welfare state, decolonization, desegregation, were in complicated ways related to that experience. Anti-fascism was a school of democracy. But in recent years, the passage of time, the failures of the educational system, and the short horizons of political leaders have eroded that valuable legacy of democratic attitudes. We are losing the struggle of memory against forgetting. Witness this, less than 60% of American adults know what Auschwitz was. Secondly, um, the spread of Nazi thought is linked to a deep history of fascist organization and, and, and action and a very extensive scale of operation. Uh, Robert Bowers, the uh, mass murderer of Pittsburgh, uh, was on a website called GAB. GAB has 300,000 to 800,000 followers, depending on whose uh, estimate you use. Um, and most of them are favorably disposed towards neo-Nazism. Um, uh, on Bauer's, we, uh, Bauer's webpage, at the top it says 1488. Now, you've probably never heard of this, but this is all over. And the 14 words, we, it refers to the 14 words, we must secure the existence of our people and a future for white children, 88, Heil Hitler. Um, and Bowers gets this um, 1488 from somebody called David Lane, and you can trace... Uh, if you, and I obviously don't have time to do this, but if you go to the history of David Lane, you can trace a succession of personal connections going back to the 1930s and the American right of the 1930s, German-American Bund camp, Long Island, 1937. Uh, third point uh, I want to make is that there's a growing political constituency um, for fascist organisers amongst alienated youth, uh, there are important reasons for that. Um, precarious employment, reaction against changing gender roles, um, internet culture. But it's also about the ability of extremists to create a certain ideological climate. Uh, this is a junior from, from Photo, from a Wisconsin school, uh, a few weeks ago. 
Um, the school, uh, school accounts of it uh, give a climate of Confederate flags, teacher condoned racism, homophobia. Now, I'm not suggesting that all these boys are highly ideological, but we have a situation where young, significant numbers of ordinary young lads think it's fine to give Nicholas a salute. Um, and I think that here we have a problem that political leaders' failure to organise and educate youth um, is becoming uh, politically uh, crucial. Um, so we have at the bottom here in a re reputable organisation survey, 46% of millennials say they'd rather be governed by e experts than elected officials. Now, they, you might say there's a good thing about this, at least they think knowledge is important, but it's not very good for democracy. Um, the fourth thing I want to say is that some of the ideas currently circulating at the highest levels of politics are not just muscular conservatism, but they are literally fascist. Steve Bannon said, and to, significantly to a French government official, we are at the end of the Enlightenment. Have you read Charles Maurras? Anybody know who Charles Maurras is? How many? No, Charles Maurras is? Okay, Charles Maurras... Uh, got his start in politics organising against Dreyfus in the 1890s in France. Um, he went on to be a collaborationist with the regime of Marshal Petain, um, a collaborationist with the Nazis, and to be found guilty of treason after the war. Steve Bannon is saying the person who we should look to for intellectual guidance is the person who wanted to keep Alfred Dreyfus on Devil's Island, and the people who... the, uh, the person who collaborated with sending the French Jews to Auschwitz. Um, I uh, want to just talk about something have I got two, three minutes? Okay. Um, I just, something um, which I had brief experience of in my youth and I realised when you get to my age one of the dangers is you keep going on about things which happened to you earlier but I think it is relevant to what I've been talking about. Um, I was a student in London in the late 1970s. And in the late 1970s, there was a powerful right-wing movement which developed called the National Front. Uh, the National Front had a lineage which goes back to Oswald Mosley and the British Union of Fascists in the 1930s. Um, and Tyndall, though, was very clever at marketing the National Front as a patriotic organisation. Everything was about the Union Jack. And, of course, it was all about immigrants. And he attracted particularly youth. There's a famous British hooli football hooligan phenomenon. Um, youth who were alienated, who particularly in the 70s were hit by unemployment, uh, were looking for some kind of uh, alternative. And they were drawn into the National Front. And of course this is the time of a uh, second generation of immigrant communities in Britain. And enormous numbers of racial attacks started to happen. Um, in 1977, the National Front tried to march through a predominantly black area of uh, London called Lewisham, and um, a lot of people got, it got in the way and blocked the street. And this led to a huge confrontation. And out of this confrontation uh, emerged a movement, actually started by an ultra-left group, the Socialist Workers' Party, uh, but we got a much bigger <coughs> following quite rapidly called the Anti-Nazi League. And what this organisation did was really two things which were important. One was it really nailed the connection between present-day fascism and Nazism and put the whole opprobrium of that history on the National Front. Secondly, it looked at youth culture and it thought, how could we get these youths together? And the two great things which were going on in Britain at that time in terms of youth culture were one, punk, and secondly, reggae music. And they were, of course, very separated by great divides, but rock against racism brought those, those cultures together and organised a series of huge cultural events, um, mass concerts, protests, uh, all kinds of cultural activities uh, with the specific message of uh, getting uh, turning against the National Front. Um, and I think significantly affected the youth culture of the time. Uh, those who are at these things, 
I think it had a huge impact on us. It really was a kind of transforming moment. So my my final message, I suppose, is that you can, if you understand what the situation is, if you address where people are, um, it is possible to make a shift in the culture and to have an impact on these situations. Good evening. Thank you all for being here. My name is Mike Wilson de Henry. Um, I'll try to keep this short. I have three themes to cover. It's a lot for ten minutes, so bear with me if I speak a little quickly. Um, here, in terms of definitions, I, I tend to agree with what my previous colleagues have said, that this is an aberration. This is not just another form of authoritarianism. I'm going to give you the sterile political science definition of fascism, and then we can criticize it at length. Uh, and I want to hear from all of you, or a lot of you, during the discussion. But uh, essentially, yes, uh, political scientists try to portray this as something that is a type of authoritarianism, a type of authoritarian regime mixed with ethno-nationalism. Uh, as Nancy said, said, I think it is particularly violent. The ideology is not just another type of conservatism, but uh, an idea that the enemy must be removed through brute force. A, a violent uh, idea of uh, eliminating opposition and eliminating worker organizations and left organizations through open violence. Um, Politically, we can add, it is driven by militarism, so war plays along uh, a, a big part of this, war making, and particularly, as I said, organized violence against quote-unquote enemies of the state, the nation, and the party. And once fascism consolidates, it tends to treat these three uh, things, state, nation, and party, as interchangeably, right? Uh, so what's good for the party is good for the nation, for example. Uh, and those enemies are foreign and domestic, as we have seen. Uh, economically, it uh, entails a state corporate alliance of uh, private sector interests with the party, where strict authoritarian rule enforces and expands the powers of elites, such as by crushing labor violently, right, and preventing people from organizing in the streets. Um, uh, I had these case studies. I'm a comparativist by training, so I like to think of, if you want to use a positivist term, the variables or factors that lead to different outcomes. Uh, uh, but I don't really have time for this, but I, I just wanted to tell you some of the things that I picked out from my reading of history and my training as a political scientist. Um, the three main factors that I think lead to different outcomes in these cases are, one, the behavior of the centrist parties, right? Uh, how the moderates, the center-left parties, behave when fascism is en route to consolidation. So, for example, in Germany, the, the uh, National Socialist Party was seen as a threat, but something that the, the democratic socialists could work with uh, during the Weimar Republic, right? And so concessions were made. People thought this is just another form of opposition. We can contain it uh, and uh, still share power with them. Um, a second one is support for the party from important sectors, such as the military, the church, private industry, uh, the populace at large. Uh, and then the third, did I say the third before? The, the second, and then the third is what resistance looks like in the streets. So what, how uh, people work to stop this before it consolidates. This is really important uh, for different scholars who have studied this comparatively. And so I want to jump ahead to the U.S. today and think not only about these cases from 90 years ago, 100 years ago, uh, 70, 80 years ago, but uh, cases today. So we can compare temporally as well as spatially uh, cases. So uh, in the U.S., what we have now is, as you've seen, violent fascism on the streets, but not quite fully consolidated in terms of its power across different sectors. Uh, uh, they, uh, there are fascists, open fascists, in the White House, but uh, there is reticent support for a fascist agenda from the military, from uh, corporate sectors, right? The private sector is interested in supporting uh, the current regime as long as it is good for the stock market, but they uh, are not necessarily uh, in line with, uh, their liberal sensibilities are hurt sometimes by uh, the fascist uh, uh, sectors of our government. Um, there's vague religious support, although fascists in the streets uh, certainly are ardent fundamentalists, right? And one of, this is one of the things that maybe I should have said here, is that 
politically and economically, these are characteristics of fascism, but culturally also, it is a fundamentalist ideology about enforcing strict uh, gender roles, for example, right? Uh, respect for authority is valued over dissent, and so on. Uh, and so uh, there is some vague religious support, but as you know, uh, it is a semi-unpopular government, and so there's plenty of opposition on the streets so far, uh, uh, and fascism hasn't fully consolidated, as you know. Brazil is totally different. In Brazil, in the second round of the presidential elections a couple of weeks ago, uh, the uh, openly fascist uh, candidate, Jair Bolsonaro, said, um, this is no longer going to be a secular state, we are a Christian state, minorities will have to assimilate or they will be removed, they will be erased, they will disappear, uh, that is his words. Uh, there, he uh, earned power with support from the largest lobbies in Congress, the, the cattle and landowners lobby, uh, the church lobby, and broader corporate sectors, uh, and the gun lobby in Brazil. So he has huge support from the populace, from uh, uh, the private sector, from the church, uh, and also from the public. I'm sorry, I already said the public, and also from the military. So it's a little bit more dangerous, a little bit closer to consolidation there, uh, just to put it in compare perspective. Now, uh, to finish up, I just have a few notes on how to confront this uh, based on these cases. One is not to mystify it, to understand its scope and not overstate it, but also not to trivialize it, right? Ignoring it has not made it go away. Uh, uh, fascism is deadly and it is going on right now, uh, whether or not it affects us personally and whether or not we are willing to acknowledge it. Uh, so don't take it for granted or trivialize it or assume, assume that just ignoring it is working, right? Uh, uh, its violence is not waiting to happen. Um, analyze its recruitment venues and tactics, its action, uh, I'm sorry, agitation playbook, right? The Milo Yiannopoulos playbook. What are his intentions when he goes out and tries to get a reaction from the media and how does that work for him? Uh, uh, and their broader strategies. If you can analyze and understand these, then you can also anticipate and counteract them and prevent them in the long term. And so you can ask yourself, to what extent are there fascists in this country? I think maybe there are indicators of this. Joey Gibson just ran for Senate in the Republican primary in Washington State. He only got 2% of the vote of the Republican primary voters. So it's quite a small percentage of the population, at least as that uh, uh, indicator would tell us. But there's a much broader sector of the population who are would-be recruits, who are the would-be recruits of this movement, right? Who are people vulnerable to fall prey to uh, fascism and the way it appeals to different people. Uh, how do they get radicalized and where? And it, you have to complicate this and assume that this is not just uh, involuntary celibate people who are insecure young white males online uh, getting recruited. It is happening in a number of ways, right? Fascism is endemic and cultural, and it is happening whether or not you are reading, uh, whether you're reading Ann Coulter or whether you are going to Bill Maher events, right? Bill Maher is an openly Islamophobic person who also normalizes violence and ethnic nationalism in his own ways. So you have to think about this in more complicated ways. Um, moving ahead, you have to understand its symbols and its framing, right? The crypto-fascism of doing a, a sign like this, which doesn't just mean okay, increasingly it means white power, uh, but these are dog whistles that people use for the insiders to recognize. Uh, Pro-Christian, really, this is how Joey Gibson and his band of fascists, the Patriot Prayer, organized on the West Coast. Uh, Pro-Christian really is a uh, ruse for anti-Semitic, anti-Muslim, I'm sorry, a facade. Uh, Paleoconservatism, just a, a reframing of anti-multiculturalism. America first, you know this well. Kekistan, drinking white milk. Uh, all of these you should understand. And also, the way that they are using law, free speech, and the right to assemble to normalize themselves. Right? So when they come out to the streets, and I'm sorry for these violent images, when they come out to the streets, police have to defend them. Police stand in the way between them and people who would attack them because it is their right to assemble. It is their right to be out there uh, spewing violent things, even though actually bigotry and bigoted speech is the main restriction on the First Amendment. Uh, but still, they can push against police lines, and whether or not police are sympathetic to them, uh, police are respecting this attack, right? These attacks, whether or not they are sympathetic to the things that these fascists are saying. Um, and so people are responding in different ways. We have to look at previous movements that have been resisting fascism in the U.S. for a long time uh, and think of creative ways to resist this. Um, there are a number of ways to do that. I think ignoring it doesn't do quite enough. 
Uh, it's clearly not gone away. People are dying. People are getting massively deported. Uh, it is getting normalized. Mocking it might be good, right? Marching behind uh, the KKK with a trombone and doing a funny or uh, might be a good way to uh, disarm their egos, right? And disarm their intentions. Uh, there's intelligence gathering and outing fascists, right? So confronting not, uh, Nazis in the streets is not the only way to do this, right? Most of the anti-fascist work takes place behind the scenes. It is identifying who shows up to the rally and then outing them to their employers so that then these people uh, can't be out of uh, their areas where they hide and organize. Uh, confronting it unequivocally and everywhere. Whether you are a science professor or a professor in humanities and social sciences, you can talk about the news, and you should talk about the news, and you should make outright statements against fascism, right? Uh, and you can be emboldened by our administrators' uh, emails saying, we want to protect the trans community on campus. Use those emails and make a statement to your classes, for example. Uh, and then beware normalization, false equivalence, the both sides rhetoric, right? The, the fascists are bad, but what about the anti-fascists? They're also bad. No, one is a really violent ideology, and another one is people organizing to contest it and defend other people who might be uh, their targets. And so, anyway, there are a lot, of, a lot of roles to play, but being one of the good ones and sitting on the sidelines has not been enough. Um, here's normalization in the Washington Post, right? Uh, Black-clad Antifa members attack peaceful fascists in Berkeley. Um, and anyway, I think I'm out of time. You could take another minute. Okay, one more minute. <laughs> one more slide. So I think that ultimately, militarized, militaristic, masculinist responses to fascism, uh, being bloodthirsty and wanting to go out and fight these people on the streets, might not be the best response, right? It might not be the best course of an action, the best antidote to diffuse this hatred. Uh, at the same time, to sit on the sidelines and condemn those people who are willing to engage in self-defense on the streets when fascists take your streets to not normalize it, I think is a problem, right? To condemn those people who are not willing to let it become normal is also a problem. This justifies, it legitimizes criminalization, repression, and o over outright violence against people. Uh, and so my main takeaway is that you shouldn't demand, we shouldn't demand that people liberate or defend themselves on our terms. Instead, we should accept the leadership of people most vulnerable, most targeted by these groups, uh, use our intersecting advantages, right? The fact that we will be read sympathetically if you're a white person like myself, if you're a male like myself, if you have citizenship status like myself, you should use your intersecting privileges and be willing to put your body on the line. And then I'll leave you with that. Thank you. I just want to give y'all a minute to read before I jump out. We can come back to it later. <laughs> 30 seconds. I'll spare 30 seconds. <laughs> So good evening, Alicia, uh, everybody. I'm Alicia Simmons from Sociology and Anthropology and Africana and Latin American Studies. And in thinking about what I would like to address for today, I've got four things. I want to think about hierarchy, victimization, resentment, and then, of course, resistance. And so in thinking about one of the ways that we can define fascism, one of its beating hearts is about the distinction between us versus them. Right? And so here we can think back to Nazi Germany, right? This is us versus them in thinking about demonizing Jews. And again, in thinking about the result, I mean, we're talking about Holocaust. Um, but we can also see this kind of rhetoric about us versus them in a contemporary day. So here I'm showing you a screenshot of Laura Ingram from Fox News. And here, as you can see at the bottom, she is making a editorial presentation saying that in some parts of the country, it, doesn't, it seems like the America we know and love doesn't exist anymore. I hope this is reminiscent of Make America Great Again, Let's Take Our Country Back. Now, 
now in thinking about why I show this to you, you note the image, right? And that's a wall, and that's people climbing over a wall. I encourage you to go see the actual clip. She also shows agriculture. There's a big tractor. There's people picking greens, right? Like, she is talking about something very specific here. It's not that our country doesn't seem like it doesn't exist anymore because we have fewer or more trees, right? She is making a very specific argument about us versus them. And as I say, this is part of the lifeblood of fascism. And so if we want to understand this idea of us versus them, we need to understand people's ideas about hierarchy, victimhood, and resentment. So in thinking about my training, I'm a sociologist. I study prejudice. I study African Americans. I study the United States. And so that's where I come to you from. But the ideas that I talk about are generalizable. We should use them to talk about race and ethnicity. We should use them to talk about gender. We should use them to talk about sexuality, about religion, right? Um, us versus them can be configured in many, many different ways. And so, just one quick thing. I need you guys to work with me on this. Let us pretend that there is the game of life. If y'all take sociology with me, intro, I'll talk a lot more about the game of life. But when I talk about the game of life, there are players. Uh, we talk about status, right? There are men and women. There are black folks and white folks, right? There are all different kinds of folks, right? That's structure, a player, a position. Then there are rules to every game, and that's culture, right? Culture are our values, our beliefs, the kinds of ways we behave, the things we think about. So there's always players, there is always a game of foot, and there are always rules. Now, I also give you this nod to social stratification. And so sociologists think about social stratification, the idea that different types of players are sorted into strata, into layers, right? There is hierarchy, right? Some people are on the top, some people are on the bottom. Sociologists assume that's a given. Every game of life involves stratification. Now, what characteristics we use to sort people into groups? Highly variable. Um, how big the difference is between the top and the bottom? Highly variable, right? And as we think about things like the emergence of fascism, right? How are we building the groups? What is the degree of difference between the top and the bottom? Hierarchy, one. And in thinking about hierarchy in the United States, I just want to quickly, quickly make the point. And if you want to hear about inequality in the United States, please, I will talk to you about it for four weeks thereabouts. Um, but what I'm showing you here is real household income by race and ethnicity over time. And what is immediately obvious, there is a hierarchy, right? Asian folks make the most money, followed by white folks who are not Hispanic. Hispanics can be of any race, and then black folks down at the bottom. Y'all probably guessed that the economic hierarchy looked like this to a certain extent. Um, we can also think about power as we think about another dimension of you know, who gets to rule the world. And as we think about power, we can see that 80% of Congress is white. And in thinking about the numbers of people, I mean, 50 black folks, right? We're talking out of 538, right? 50 of them were black folks as of last year. Only two of them were Native American. Right? So as we talk about hierarchy, there's clearly a race-ethnicity hierarchy. There's also clearly a gender hierarchy. Right Here I'm showing you uh, the gender pay gap. It's looking better, right? It's looking better, especially for your youngest cohort, but that's still a gap, right? Um, and again, as we want to think about political power as something that matters, I mean, you wouldn't make up half of the population, right? But only taking on 20% of the Senate, 20% of the House, Right? I mean, things might have changed a bit since last week, but this is inequality, right? No doubt. So is there hierarchy in the United States? Why, yes, there is. So then victimhood, right? People are invested in hierarchy. Hierarchy is natural. But we have a big old hierarchy based on race, on gender, right? Now, in thinking about victimhood, some people are worried about their place in the hierarchy. One of the things that makes people worried is what we call ontological insecurity, and that's the struggle of modernity. It's the idea that people feel like strangers in their own land. Well, gay people can get married. Women are working outside of the house. 
right? As the world changes, culture and structure changes, it brings some people deep anxiety, real anxiety. But that anxiety leads to things like authoritarianism and punishment, an effort to try to reassert the world that we had lost, make America great again, bring my country back. There is something very romantic about this, um, yearning for the past worried about place and hierarchy. And then I also show you group position. Um, and here's how we talk about prejudice based on hierarchy. Um, when you're thinking about other groups in relation to one's own, the prejudiced person believes that their group is the best. America first, right? Um, they believe that the out group is intrinsically alien or different by the shithole countries over there. Right. Um, In-group proprietary claims, our rights, what we deserve, and fear and suspicion, they're coming to take our jobs. They're coming to hurt us. They're coming to take our college education. They're coming. Fear. Victimhood. And it doesn't matter whether or not those fears are real. If they feel real, that's good enough. So in thinking about what that might look like, again, make America strong, right? Um, in thinking about these buttons, right? To come and take it, don't tread on me, right? You can feel the fear coming for the insecurity. And so it all leads to resentment. And so this is going to be my very quick tutorial on the nature of prejudice. Uh, questions, I'm happy to take them later on. So one, stereotypes, right? Um, if I say things like Asian folks are good at math, um, black folks are lazy, right? Y'all have heard that before, right? Exaggerated beliefs. Now, none of y'all clutched your pearls when I said that, right? Y'all know that to be true. Again, culture, right? This is part of the rules of the nation. But whether or not you believe that, now that's another story. Right? We know, or you know, as best as science can tell us, knowledge widespread, endorsement on the decline. So yeah, you should worry about the people that wake up in the morning and say those terrible things, but they're not everybody. But these ideas, they're in all of our heads. And that matters. So prejudice is when you have these stereotypes and then you add emotion to it. Right? I think this about you and I don't like you. You add on that emotional component. Prejudice is hot. And again, we can talk about explicit prejudice. Some people wake up in the morning and they're, I hate those people. But not most of us, right? But implicit prejudice? Think about what's in our children's books, what's in our movies, right? What's in our language. It's all in all of our heads. So we're all susceptible to the plans, to the recruitment efforts. It could be any of us. And as we think about prejudice, we've made this shift from biological to cultural ideas. It's not that black folks or women are biologically inferior. They just don't know how to act right. They're too sensitive. They're too angry. They're too loud. And so in thinking about what the resentful narrative looks like, people believe that systematic inequalities are in the past as we think about forgetting history. Slavery really wasn't all that long ago, right? Um, we can think that any current inequities are a result of deficient culture. Those Mexicans just don't know how to act. Those feminists, they just don't know how to act. And as such, any special attention is unwarranted and requests for such attention beget animosity. Why are you talking about race? Why are you talking about gender? Why should I care about those gay people? Knock it off. It's fine. And so in thinking about what resentment looks like, unfairness is at the heart of it. They're cutting in line. They're taking what is mine, right? In thinking about conservatism, not so much. It's correlated, but it's not a big player. Not in the way that a lack of sympathy, admiration, I mean, that's what resentment is, right? You make that noise, that's resentment. And then in thinking about racial beliefs, again, it's on their culture, and the biggest one of all is the threat. If we're trying to figure out what makes people hot, what makes people oppose things like affirmative action, oppose things like equal pay, it's this. It's threat to who's on top. Something that we can all be susceptible to. Now, 
I know I have to wrap up, so I'm going to skip my little quotes there, and I'm going to do my resistance thing really quick. And so what do I ask of you to move forward? One, to be educated about the past, right? Come sit with me. I will tell you all about inequality so that you will know and so that you're ready to tell others. Please be brave to disrupt micro-level games, the games you're playing over Thanksgiving with your family and your friends back home, the games you play late night with your friends, right? Be willing to disrupt them. Because again, verbal rejection, avoidance, physical attacks, extermination, it can come in any of these forms. Be ready to disrupt. And determination to disrupt the macro level games. In thinking about voter disenfranchisement, that is real. And that is about power and the preservation of power. And so as I look on this world, the ideas of prejudice and stereotypes, that's all America. None of that surprises me. But it's becoming normalized. And these are the seeds. And so I encourage you to be brave and to be determined. Thank you. science and Jewish studies, and uh, what I wanted to talk about tonight was some of that uh, I've been feeling strongly about since the attack on the Tree of Life uh, synagogue, which is how frustrating it is to be in the position of, of course, having to oppose fascism or having to oppose this extremism and, and what it does to that minority group and um, how we should be thinking about that. And so what I want to do is first review what the traditional way of combating anti-Semitism is and um, what sort of self-understanding that imposes upon the Jewish community. I'm going to just have that kind of parochial angle on this thing. And then uh, to think about, you know, are there other models of uh, minorities of group uh, ethnicity that we should think about that are actually more, um, perhaps more appropriate or... Um, that would be sort of more successful in combating uh, anti-Semitism today. And so uh, this, this comes again partly from this notion of, you know, seeing in the, in the aftermath of uh, the Tree of Life, just this feeling, you know, like, why is this our problem? Um, you know, going to synagogue and feeling like it has to be, we have to have armed guards, we have to harden our targets. And, you know, I was thinking about that, which was often this complaint to Martin Luther King, this isn't actually for us to, to do, right? This is their problem. This is their work, not actually ours. And um, I've just been in that mind, of course, well, we know we have to do something, but I've been sort of in that mindset. And then I, I recently read an article by uh, Abe Foxman, who's the longtime uh, director of the Anti-Defamation League uh, since 1987, and then he retired around last year. So for about 30 years, the Anti-Defamation League, which was founded in 1913, is maybe the leading organization for fighting anti-Semitism. And, you know, reading this article that it just appeared in the Jewish press, um, I had these sort of two feelings about it. One was their accomplishment was incredible for so long, for you know, many decades they managed to really tamp down anti-Semitism. Uh, it was, you know, and then it was this feeling that I, I hate the way that he talks about it, um, which I always have, basically, since uh, the 1990s. This is also kind of my moment of, of uh, memory that John was talking about back, uh, back in the 1990s. I, you know, I already had this feeling, why do we have to he talks about us as a minority, and we always have to be protected, and we have to combat this. And that felt very out of date, you know, in the 1990s. Um, that felt like we were actually in a multicultural moment, um, and that this was no longer kind of appropriate to think about ourselves in this way. Um, and so I kind of have this frustration, but I, I don't know whether that's a kind of childish frustration to have. So I, I want to first just um, read about his sense of uh, accomplishment and then talk a little bit about how he 
the, the factors for doing it, and then we can get into this, this question of multiculturalism versus a kind of minority self-understanding. So uh, he says about anti-Semitism that the way they managed to conquer it is, quote, by making it unacceptable in America. We didn't come up with vaccines or an antidote to eliminate it, but we created an atmosphere where it was socially unacceptable to express it. You could be an anti-Semite in your heart, in your mind, but if you acted it out, there would be consequences in your workplace, in your social environment. This is the security blanket of a social contract that some call political correctness and others call our value system. Um, and I, you know, I think a lot of people might agree today that um, you know, what's been, in a political sense, been uh, derided as political correctness it was in fact the accomplishment of all the civil rights groups fighting for 30, 40 years uh, to achieve that. And, you know, we, and we can't let that go so easily. Um, and the difficulty is that the, the factors which allow that to be possible are really eroded. And, and the Foxman in the article talks about uh, several of these. He talks about uh, several of which have been mentioned already tonight. So he talks about um, the memory of the Holocaust. You know, he says one of the reasons they were so successful uh, in those years, in the 60s, 70s, is because the memory of the Holocaust was new and people were ashamed. You know, they were ashamed to be anti-Semitic in that culture. And uh, Again, Foxman does not at all think that people who are not anti-Semitic, but he thinks this was latent, that they, they couldn't express themselves. Um, it was the new impression of the, the State of Israel, which had been founded in 48, uh, which seemed to have a, a new kind of heroic Judaism which people, was changing sort of people's minds and giving a kind of positive image, uh, like John said also. Those, those sorts of things, that history is, seems long past. Um, and then it was, of course, the authoritative example of the politicians in the media who made it, um, you know, absolutely anathema to speak this way. Uh, he, he talks about how that was structurally the case that when you watch Walter Cronkite, when you watch him on television, the news anchor, they were a kind of voice of authority, and they simply did not speak in these kind of racist terms. Uh, you can see how different that was uh, on you know, Fox or something like this at that point, uh, at this point. Um, and so a lot of those things are basically gone, the things that made, that made that possible. Um, and what Foxman worries about this together as, uh, mean, as at the moment, uh, the majority forgetting about what he calls, quote, the fragility of the minority groups. Uh, that people in government, people in media don't realize what a difficult position that we're in. And, and that's the thing which, uh, again, I, I sort of personally hate and find extremely difficult, um, but may be true, you, you know, I, that, that, and it speaks to the victimhood uh, that Alicia was talking about and we'll talk about later. So, uh, as a matter of fact, of course, the Jewish people in America, the Jewish community, is a minority. Uh, we're about, as of 2013, it was the last estimate, it's about 6.8 million Jews in America. That's 2.15% uh, of the American population. So, absolutely speaking, factually, we are an absolute uh, minority. Um, again, the way that I felt about it in the 1990s and still like to feel about it is as if we're just one group among many others. Um, you know, you tell me about your identity, I tell you about yours, it doesn't matter that we're 2.15% and some other group might be 40%. That's sort of irrelevant to the way that I experience uh, identity. But, um, but for Fossman, that, that, that sort of sense of guilt, that sort of sense of regret or needing to protect others was absolutely essential to what made it possible uh, to, to drive those things into kind of latency. Um, and so uh, I was trying to think about if, if it's the case that we are being pushed back into a, this minority-majority dynamic where we have to say we are this minority, we need to be protected, etc. Um, is that something that's reflecting a general change in the way that we represent uh, ethnicity to each other. Um, and so I, th I had this kind of hypothesis, oh, maybe this is the case, that everybody's thinking this way, because it seems these extremists think in a kind of majoritarianism, uh, a minority kind of framework. Um, but actually, I think the story is more complicated than this. I was talking to Professor Ludwig in my department, who's a, a, an expert in public opinion, and he pointed me to this book, Identity Crisis, uh, which is brand new, uh, about it based on survey research. And the difficulties where extremists might think in terms of majority-minority categories, it, it seems that the Trump voters 
do not necessarily. Um, what, what's the strange twist is they think, seem to think in terms of identity. So kind of in that kind of multicultural framework that I was thinking about in the 90s today, um, which is this very peculiar thing. And it could be that some of this is cooked by the survey data, but they, they seem at least somewhat to be thinking in categories where, um, where again, whiteness uh, or kind of the white majoritarianism is, in fact, for them just a question of identity. And you can see this here um, in terms of this 2016 voter survey. You can see that um, it's, it's somewhat important to be of European heritage. Being Christian is quite important to Republicans. Right? You're talking about something like 60% uh, speaking English. There's a kind of sense of um, that this is an identity issue. And you can see that this is especially true um, of voters for Trump rather than other uh, Republican primary voters, which I thought was a very useful kind of comparison because it, you know, we're not just like Looking at a Republican Democrat, but this is a so this this weak identity, strong identity was an index of four questions about how important is it to you your white identity, um, and you can see that for strong identity, those people came out and voted for Trump much more than for others, and to, to, so I kind of find that actually the picture is much more complicated than that I thought. Um, if you have if if we're being kind of pushed. Um, in order to, to oppose fascism into a kind of majority-minority um, idiom, then it, it, it seems odd that we might be in a kind of more old-fashioned idiom than, in fact, this kind of new, the new Trump voters, who might actually be in a kind of identity idiom. So the, the, one, the other thing that I don't know, and you see this in the posters about it's okay to be white, is to what extent are they just adopting that idiom for political purposes, just to tweak the libs? You know, is that a kind of ironic use of that? And that's something, again, the polling data doesn't really distinguish between those things. Um, so I'll just end uh, on this thought, which is, you know, I thought it would be a kind of interesting thought experiment, which I think is already coming up to, um, in a few of the other presentations, which is, what would it look like if we opposed uh, fascism or this kind of extremism in a way that didn't do that, that, that attempted to be more multicultural, that attempted to be uh, to, to embrace that kind of newer way of thinking. And, you know, I don't have great examples of this, but I was thinking about the media coverage, for instance, and I was thinking that I, that was something that I actually thought was done well in the wake of the Tree of Life um, the Tree of Life Massacre, where actually the Jewish community was treated with respect. Uh, it was treated where you, you could see the difference. You could see the Jewish people were not the same as all other people, that they were doing something different on that Saturday morning, but not in a way that was too different, you know, in a way that it was understandable. Oh, this is the common different thing that you were doing. And, and I was pleased to see that even on the BBC News Hour, which sort of makes a habit of making people as exotic as possible. Um, and so, you know, I thought there, there's sort of hope for that approach. Uh, law enforcement, uh, Abe Foxman, law them, and I think that's right, are sensitive to those kinds of differences. Um, and so it's possible that we could, we could do something along those lines. Uh, thank you. All my colleagues are really hard acts to follow. Um, and I want to make a really small point in hopes of it making a connection in a really practical way. I'm going to talk about some really banal, even humorous stuff for a minute, and the scary stuff will come back in at the end. Um, so I want to draw our attention to some distinctions that philosophers of language make about statements and dialogue. We're all familiar with the distinction between what's literally said and what is implied. When a server comes to us for the third time in a restaurant to ask if we need anything else, we get it. The manager wants the table, and we should pay up and go. And part of why we get it is that we tend to assume that people don't reseek information they already have. We already told the server we didn't need anything, so genuinely wanting to know can't be why they came back and asked us again 10 minutes later if we need anything. 
They must have some other reason, oh, such as wanting to prompt us about what we are doing there if we're not going to order anything else. In general, there are norms, they vary from context to context, that shape how conversations typically unfold. You don't ask questions when you already know the answer, unless you're a teacher quizzing your students. You don't say true things that everyone already knows unless you have some motive other than informing people, and so on. And you can imply what you don't say, sometimes precisely by deliberately violating a relevant norm. So for example, and I swear I've never done this, suppose I write a rec letter for a student that goes like this. I am happy to recommend so-and-so. She did all the required work for my class. She turned all that work in on time. She has lovely handwriting. <laughs> Let's suppose I only said true things. Those were all true things. But there's a norm for rec letters that you're going to say as many positive things as you can, as enthusiastically as you can. And so the brevity and non-specificity of that letter implies that that student is utterly undistinguished. It can take a little while to figure out sometimes when someone is violating a norm on conversation, and so implying what she doesn't say, and when instead they're following a more complicated norm. Some of us may have had elementary school teachers who would say in really saccharine, passive-aggressive ways things like, I really like how Emily is raising her hand quietly, <laughs> where what is implied is Trevor needs to stop rolling around on the rug. Um, but sometimes there's a perfectly good reason why you're praising one person in a group, and you're not implying anything about others in your audience at all. My youngest kid had a really hard time mastering this cultural point. If I would say to my older kid, thank you for mopping up that cat puke, you are such a big help, the little one would say, I not a help? Or I'd say to my husband, I really love you, and the little one would say, you not love me? <laughs> At first, we tried patiently explaining what was going on, but eventually it got clear he actually got it and he was just being a jerk. <laughs> so we told him to stop and we started treating it like any other form of problematic little kid behavior and he stopped. The point of this story is that while philosophers of language and sociolinguists actively debate some of the finer points empirically about exactly how these mechanisms work, most of us make it to voting age pretty well able to navigate this. If someone protests proposed school budget cuts by shouting, art and music matter, at a school board meeting, no one takes her to mean that math doesn't matter. If your mom says to your sibling, who just saved a plate from crashing to the floor, you're the best, you don't feel wounded, and assuming you're not four, you don't say, I'm not best. <laughs> In other words, we all get pretty good training from the various cultures in which we operate at figuring out from context how to interpret what is said and what is implied. And when people all of a sudden start acting like they have no idea about this, they're gaslighting you. Um, we're pretty good at sussing out what goes without saying, so that if it is said, the person who says it must be being motivated by something other than a sincere desire to impart information. So claims like it's okay to be white, or everyone should be proud of their heritage, present interesting cases. The claims are so true and so banal, who could object? And yet, precisely because they are true and banal, you wonder, why do they say them? What's implied? You assume something's going on, and it is, just like there would have been something going on if I had actually written that fake rec letter. The gambits that members of the various groups that my colleagues have been talking about make in their efforts to recruit on college campuses, because they really do have very specific <laughs> efforts to recruit on college campuses, enable them to make a really effective equivocation. If you complain, they can insist that we look simply at what they said and play dumb about what was implied, as if we don't all traffic in implications all the time. And if you don't complain, you've let their implications stand without challenge. And the implications are that somehow white people like me are being forced, by whom? To deny that it is okay to be us, so that it's really important to assert this banal claim. Now spelling that out quickly on their blogs takes them to non-innocuous places. Now the reason for belaboring all of this is that when you feel that these groups are not playing fair rhetorically, your intuition is right. They position themselves as courageously broaching topics for conversation that no one else will. 
But they don't really position themselves as ready for a conversation because they put us, their audience, in double binds, unable either to engage them or to remain silent without looking stupid. That kind of playing gotcha is not how someone who cares about finding the truth through dialogue behaves. Now, of course, the fact that these groups don't respect rhetorical norms is sort of the least of their failings. Um, here's why I wanted to talk about it. It may be true that a particular group, take Identity Europa, is dangerous <coughs> or vicious. But it's probably also true that starting off with that point when you're talking to one of their potential recruits may not be the most tactical approach. And we should be thinking tactically precisely because we judge these groups to be dangerous and vicious. That's why we don't want them to get more recruits. I'm a proud American citizen. I'm the proud granddaughter and niece of men who fought in World War II. I'm the proud mother of mixed race kids. I'm Roman Catholic. For these and all kinds of other reasons, I want these groups to shrink. I want them to go away. But in academic contexts, and I'm gonna sound old, especially where undergraduates are concerned, we can make an additional point. As someone who cares about the particular new and enthusiastic students who come up the hill every year, I don't want them, you, to join, not just for my own sake, but for theirs. And I'm thinking that as an academic community, we have an obligation to consider why some of us might find the rhetoric of these groups tempting, not because they have anything to say that is worthy of our intellectual attention, but precisely because they don't. The scary thing about propaganda is that it works. People who flyer, it's okay to be white, here, who unfurl a banner in Florida at a racial justice rally saying, we apologize for nothing, are not really inviting curious young people to a serious, in-depth conversation, but they've managed to convince some young people that they are. There are really important, interesting debates to be had about the causes of white rural poverty, about what a nation owes the descendants of people it harmed in the past, about whether there is any politics that's not identity politics, about the costs and benefits of shifting to a majority-minority nation. It's a psychological question why certain people, often but not always white people, think it has become impossible to have these difficult conversations on college campuses. But some people have started to think this. And getting them to appreciate that that belief is false seems to me like an important part of saving them from propaganda. One way to show them that those beliefs are false is to be visibly having those very conversations and showing them to be real conversations, not gotcha exercises. This connects to the points about rupture that people were making earlier. I've been really troubled by grown-ups who think that the initial forays of the alt-right into conversational spaces like Colgate's are no different from any other kind of provocative speech. From a legal First Amendment perspective, they're probably right. There's no legal grounds for saying that these initial foray comments can't be said. And I mostly think that the remedy for problematic speech is more speech. But I think it's important to point out over and over and over again that the provocations that are being offered, and I'm speaking specifically here to the undergraduates in the room, the provocations that are being offered to you from the alt-right are not really brave invitations to difficult, nuanced conversations, because they're not invitations to conversations at all. Part of fascism's viciousness is the way it twists noble motivations. Bravery in the pursuit of truth, fierce independence in the face of groupthink, those are virtues, and I know I sound old, I think those are virtues that are especially appealing to 18 to 22 year olds. Society gives me direct control over the shaping of my kids' characters. We're not supposed to talk about the university being in local parenthesis anymore. Society is rightly squeamish if myself and my colleagues were to seek to mold our students the way we might seek to mold kids that we're parents and guardians of. But when my students that I care about are being sold a very dangerous bill of goods, I think we have a duty to be especially clear about what intellectual bravery actually looks like. Thank you to my brave and brilliant colleagues. Those were wonderful, better than I could have even dreamed presentations. And now I'm sure 
that there are, uh, there's a nice black slide. I'm sure that there are many comments and especially questions from the floor. Maybe you want to move your chairs and if some people, a few people have to leave. Who wants to start us out? Speak loud and maybe stand up. Um, so, um, so um, just like during his speech, I feel like I know it's everyone. So I was just thinking that is it the case that we have this ideology and what it called phenomena as like combining Western society? And if yes, why would, why should that be the case? And if no, should I respond right away? Okay, so I think that there's a difference between people who are racist and people who are fascist in mainly for me, and this can be contested, right? I'm, I'm not saying I have the answer, but I think mainly the difference is whether you are willing to act violently upon it and whether you are organizing for a political uh, goal, for political agendas, right? So you could be a bigot and not quite necessarily a fascist. Uh, that's my conceptual sort of bordering. Um, I think you could be a white supremacist, and as long as you don't, uh, are, you aren't politically organizing to make yourself uh, take over the state or uh, acting on it violently, then you're just a bigot, right? And not quite a fascist. So I was just curious, like, um, because I this kind of phenomena of finding to like Western society, particularly led by Europeans in North America, seems to be North and South America. And if not, how is like uh, this kind of phenomena also seen in other kinds of society? Yeah. Um, so my my specialty is in Latin America. I'm from Latin America. I study Latin America. There is a lot of fascism in Latin America, and so I don't think that it's a unique to white uh, European Anglo-Saxon societies, but uh, maybe to the Western world, uh, you could see elements of fascism in Southeast Asia, for example. Uh, and so, yeah, it may not in Japan exactly. So not not necessarily only germane to Western society. But John, I think you had something to say. No, just. Just that, I mean, uh, Japan in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, clearly, I think, is a fascist society on almost any reasonable definition um, and, of course, caused absolute mayhem throughout the, the region um, as a consequence. Yeah. Um, so I feel like a lot of um, uh, things that, based on all of your presentations, would be clearly considered like fascist, like dog whistling kind of language. And I feel like, but because it's presented, and you know the way Charlotte's school functioned, like they were like nice white boys in khakis and polos. Um, and so I feel like a lot of the ways it functions, it's like in a nice box, and they put a little bow on it. And so you can't really say that that's fascist, they shouldn't say that because, you know, um, maybe they'll say, like, it's not that there's in, uh, income inequality with black folks, it's because of their culture, or something like that, which is a quote from a certain somebody that you can look up. Um, but, so I'm wondering, and especially on college campuses where we have, you know, this, we're, we're not trying to impede on anyone's free speech, how do we function, like, work through them, or... or, or that's where I'm running into a wall of like how do you kind of work around that when people see it on its face like that it's okay to be white and go, well, yeah. Um, when there's institutional structures that protect them. Fun question. <laughs> you're not asking me, are you? <laughs> well, I, I, you know, I, like how do you function in an institution that has... Um, built up in a way that has these protections in, like, th that has built-in protections at this point, because the way that they say these fascist things are nice and neat and cannot be immediately linked to anything inherently racist or 
homophobic or sexist? Like, how do you function when you're working in an institution that has built-in safeguards? I know that doesn't really have an answer, but it's a point of frustration for me. I think you could apply your own sociological analysis and talk it out with the students and have them think about it out loud and be unequivocal about the links between something like it's okay to be white and what you know it to be underneath so that it doesn't come across as these are just dorks wearing khakis, right? Uh, so you have a responsibility, a role to play in forming a sociological analysis that connects these links, that makes these links. But I also think it's... Asking people to be to fess up to their motivations for wanting to have certain kinds of utterances come out of their mouth, I think is a perfectly fair and appropriate and important educative thing. And I, ironically, I think it's sort of an extension of our postering policy. Right? You can post all sorts of intriguing, inflammatory sort of stuff. Maybe not inflammatory, but right. If you own it and you say, I as a member of this community want to have a conversation about such and such, that's, that's very different from I'm going to resist any effort to probe why I'm going where I'm going. And I think that's oftentimes, especially if you fill people in on the background of do you know how you're likely to be interpreted and where this comes from and share the history, that puts people in an interesting place. And I'd like to believe that there's enough of us around that are still capable of having those conversations. But you're right, if all people want to do is put a token out, like one utterance, and then sort of walk away, it is, it's very hard to know how to maneuver. I think the thing to do is to make that move look less appealing to the people who are watching them do it. Um. So in my thesis research, I've been doing a lot of research on Trump's post-election rallies, and something that I've found is that he's not trying to recruit new supporters, he's just reaffirming that connection to that core of America he's found. Um, so my question is, what, what do we do about that group of America? Not the group that he's trying to recruit, I think you guys had a lot of great suggestions about that, but the group that's firmly believing what he's saying and is bought in, besides making it socially unacceptable to act on those beliefs, is there a point of re-education or is that past now? Um, that's a really difficult question. I think that is a symptom of the just to be analytic, I'm not sure what to, what to do yet, but um, I think that's part of the politics of turnout, right? That's uh, Trump knows, right, that he basically needs to turn out his base in you know the greatest numbers possible, uh, and he's he's trying to do that so he can do things like motivate everybody in Pennsylvania who's not in the city of Philadelphia and things like that, and you know he's trying to 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 maneuver in that way. And how do you combat that? Uh, obviously. You also, just from a political sense, um, you, you're working on your own turnout campaigns and you're working on that kind of thing. And um, that's not a satisfying answer from a cultural sense. From a political sense, you, you want to win the election uh, and to try and do that. Uh, could we get to a place where we didn't have a politics just of turnout, where it was a more substantive, deliberative politics? I think everyone would like that. Um, I think we feel a very far away from that. Um, perhaps his attack on, on the news media will backfire to the point that uh, the news media themselves will reform their practices and maybe lead from there, maybe. I mean, it's kind of hard to imagine getting there at the moment, but uh, the attacks will become so bald that maybe something like that could happen. Um, so I'd also like to take a shot at it. Um, so, I mean, what do you do with the base, right? I mean, we can try to, they are not the majority, and that's something I try to take a lot of, you know, solace in. They really don't believe they are the majority. Um, but I don't want to write them off, right? They're still our brothers and sisters, my dad, um, right? <laughs> for real, for real. Um, maybe I'll send him the tape, who knows. Um, <laughs> So how do we work with them? I mean, part of it is to 
I talked about ontological insecurity, but there are also very real economic insecurities, right? As we think about coalition building, as we think about helping people find their interests, right? So there's this great book, um, we could talk about it, but Arlie Hauschild writes this book, Strangers in Her Own La- in Their Own Land. And so she goes down to the Louisiana Gulf Coast, post Deepwater Horizon, right? So deep what's going on on the coast, right? Like devastation. The livelihood is based on fishing and tourism, right? Oil. So Hauschild goes with the question, these people should obviously be in favor of government regulation. They should be voting Democrat. No. They're all voting Republican, right? And that's a puzzle. Why are you voting against your interests? And what House Child comes out to say is that people have emotional interests, right? And you know, I don't think she talks enough about prejudice. I want to talk to her about prejudice. But in any event, so how can we help people see their different motivations, right? So I talked about this idea that fairness is so important to racial resentment. But how do you want to think about fairness, right? Is fairness that we should all have exactly the same thing at the end of the day? Is fairness that we should all have an equal shot? Is fairness to make up for what we've done, right? Um, We think about, you know, egalitarianism. Everybody should be equal. Um, There's a difference between egalitarianism and, like, equality, right? I mean, there are many different ways. Should we all have the same view, or should the short people, you know, get a box and the tall people don't get it, right? So, We all have these values and beliefs, and if we think about dominant culture, it's stuff we all should share. I mean, the egalitarianism, the fairness, and so those values exist, and how can we shape those values and help people rethink their values? Um, With me, it's always about, you know, the evidence and compassion. I don't don't try to run around calling people racist, um, but I'm certainly willing to say, hey, let's think about that moment for a minute. Why that pick, right? The, the inquiry, the compassionate inquiry. Um, yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that. When, um, just during uh, your guys' speeches, I was thinking about how um, I think the making, making like white supremacy and hate speech seem culturally not okay didn't make it go away, it just brought it into people's homes and into their heads. And so I think the disdain can be really dangerous as well. Even if you're not seeing it on the streets, it's still there. So I think like compassionate inquiry and like if you can actually reach reach out to someone is um, definitely the idea. Um, I have a question. So, in light of the recent anti-Semitic events that happened in Pittsburgh, I think that like Jews are in a really difficult position because a lot of times are thought of as like too white or advantaged, like within the recent our recent history to be a minority, as we have talked about. But yeah, we still are in this position where we are being like I mean, it's to be coming from a Jewish perspective, um, are being like targeted and. Um, hate it. Um, so how do we reconcile, deal with that position um, with other minority groups um, in a white supremacist lens? Like, how do we handle that? Nice. I have a follow-up. <laughs> yeah. We just have to remember that that's talking about Jews that look like you and me. Yes, for sure. There are Jews of color. Yeah, definitely. And that's coming from a white Jewish lens. All right, I'll start. I'll I'll, I'll, I'll start and take a swing. Um, So we talk about intersectionality, right? This idea that we are all bundles of characteristics. And those bundles of characteristics mean it's not just like an ad ad, right? Um, There's all different kinds of positionality. You know, for me, as, you know, a woman of color, my brother has a very different experience of this world than I do. 
right? Um, we grew up in the same house, but gender matters, right? My best friend from college who's white, like, we went to the same school and have very different experiences, right? Um, so in thinking about coalition building, um, certainly between the African American community and the Jewish community, there, you know, civil rights, like, there is history of that. And in thinking about, I, and again, you know, I study African Americans, so I'll just come at it from there. Um, the African American community has a high degree of shared fate this idea that what happens to one of us happens to all of us right it has implications and so I think the more we can build that kind of perspective, right? Um, yes, even though Jewish people have more economic resources, that does not mean that they don't have other characteristics that can immediately send them to the bottom of the hierarchy, right? There are hierarchies upon hierarchies. So economically, and that can make you a target, right? Because whose money are you taking? Who does that money rightfully belong to? Um, so from my perspective, right, building that bubble of shared fate, um, yeah, it's going to be that different experience, and I love that, right? Um, but yeah, I, I think the more that we can talk about what happens, I mean, they'll come for you next, right? Yeah, I think that's really helpful. I think um, the notion of coalition, uh, the notion of appealing to uh, universal values, let's say, you know, that was, of course, the old strategy of the, the groups that fought anti-Semitism for so many years, uh, not only the Anti-Defamation League, but uh, the American Jewish Committee, um, which you know, was so dedicated to civil rights for everyone. Uh, that was the message post-World War II, and, and maybe a message that could resonate again. I think you hear it sometimes on the call-in shows and the radios. When you hear the oldest generation call, you know, the, those World War II vets, and they say, I don't recognize this country anymore. Why did I go to Europe to fight? I think, let's say politically, that, that could be an opening for us. That could be a message uh, to rally behind um, because, it, you know, it is outrageous. Um, and, and I think we, we have been, in a sense, politically outmaneuvered. I think your question really speaks to that. Uh, and I think that's very political. I mean, the use of victimhood in bizarre ways. You know, well, I didn't show you in this book, but um, the, the Trump voters are not politically disadvantaged. The, the data shows uh, they actually are, are fairly well off. Uh, they're not all college educated, but they, in fact, are doing fine in the country. And so one of the, one of the twists in the thing is there's a kind of rhetoric, there's a, a politics of a kind of victim without that kind of actuality there. And, uh, um, you know, that's not 100% case, but let's say the majority of the voters. And so a lot of this is, is political. Um, and so I, I think maybe we have to think about that uh, and return to a kind of message which, you know, you could think about it as multiculturalism, you could think about it um, as, civil as civil rights or civil liberties, um, as anti-fascism, you know, there, there are many different ways to do it, but maybe something like that. I, I mean, I think one point that comes out of what Alicia and uh, Noah were saying is really the importance of history. I mean, there's this deep history of um, Jewish labor radicalism and Jewish connection to civil rights and so on. And I think rediscovering these histories, which a lot of people have tried to bury for various political reasons, is really important for thinking things through and as a resource. And I think that's, you know, that's true across the board of society, that we, a lot of what we think is normal was not normal in the past. And we need to rediscover that past uh, as, as a resource to deal with the present. Okay. Good one. Two more questions. So you guys spoke a little bit about like the memory of the Holocaust, and as that fades, it seems as if anti-Semitism and this hate increases with the decrease of the memory of that. So after bloodshed, especially like 9/11, Parkland shootings, uh, the Tree of Life synagogue, that's when discussion and that's when like support comes out for these communities. And then it fades with the memory, and then and another event occurs, and it's just like this vicious cycle. So, how do you end that without more bloodshed and without more events? Yeah. <laughs> 
I think, okay, I'll, I'll jump in. <laughs> I think part of it is, as I was saying in my presentation, is that we need a party that is willing to be unequivocal about these things and establish that we will not accept fascism, we will not negotiate with it, and that we'll propose bold alternatives, right? So not negotiating with it, not proposing bipartisanship with fascism, but to step up and say, we do not accept this, and here is the alternative. And I think people will jump to that, uh, that will appeal and it, if you work from a, a position of compassion and bringing people in rather than uh, drawing the lines further, yeah, that would work. Can I just add a footnote? I mean, I think it has to do to some extent with that shared fate idea. And I mean, I'm just thinking of a specific series of debates that I'm familiar with is that you would see you see coalitions sort of struggling to form sometimes so that people don't appear as if they're being patronizing and also so that they don't appear as if they're saying, um, you know, don't discriminate against me, but it's okay if you discriminate against these other people. So, like, I'm thinking of um, activism in the Sikh American community after 9-11 where initially some people would be like, we need to make sure that people understand we're not Muslims um, just because we have turbans. And other people would say, hang on a minute. It's not like we want them to kill the Muslims and not us, right? And, and sort of you saw some of this after Tree of Life of different communities that had been targeted in various ways, trying to find something that they all have in common that can sometimes sound very your grandparents or my grandparents and kind of sometimes almost bordering on patronizing because it's so missing the element of irony that we tend to associate with intelligent politics, but of just saying, I'm American and I don't want people to get shot at their house of worship. Um, I, I don't really get what you do with your turban, but I'm, I'm going to be quite happy for you to do it in my neighborhood, right, at your house of worship. And I think letting people be more upfront and unironic, even if it doesn't sound very sophisticated, and claim those shared values to form a coalition identity around, I think that's really, really, really important. Can I just say one thing? I mean, several people have mentioned this question of sort of empathy and connection and so on. And I think one of the most remarkable things about the um, current non neo fascist or whatever you want to call it phenomenon in the, in the US is the delegitimization of altruism. Right, and the way that there's, there's actually been a systematic campaign to say if you do things for other people, if you do things that are not in your own interest, you're dumb. Okay, and I think there's a bit of a connection with that to the um, campaign for the total free market, which yeah, there's a wonderful book by Kim Phillips Fine about how ever since the 1930s, there's been a core of people starting with turning against the New Deal, trying to sell the idea that there should be no state intervention. And, you know, you can argue, of course, to have a perfectly legitimate democratic argument about the role of the, uh, the, the, role of the state and, 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 and so on. But in its extreme form, what that pushes people to think is that anything that is done from outside to help other people is intrinsically bad. So it creates the ideological ground for what this to happen, I think. So I just want to end with a question to everyone, and it's kind of a, a question to leave you with, um, but maybe someone will have something to say. Uh, I had a sense when I reached out to colleagues on the faculty that people thought this was important, and that calling, calling out white supremacist organizations and neo-Nazi organizations and calling them fascist was not an overreach, a, a rhetorical overreach. Um, and so I, I'm confident that calling this panel what we called it um, was right, even though it felt scary to us. We were like scared by our own title, um, how to oppose the, the return to fascism. So I just want to leave you with a question, which is how has your everyday labor changed? And how does our everyday labor, all of our everyday labor, have to change? because of this threat. Can I suggest something? Um, the, the only thing I've been able to do so far, but I do it every chance I get, is always call it, always say it. 
always call it by a name. Yeah. Always, whenever there's anything adjacent, bring it, bring this out. Bring out ugliness. Call it ugliness. Bring out, when you're talking about how someone's doing something really well, counterpose it against, against hate speech. Counterpose it against what it's closest to, what it, what is its, its inverted self. And in every conversation, um, in, in, today I introduced a speaker who's working on uh, fascism. And so talk about now. So why we need this now. And maybe it's just two sentences. But it's never, never, try, try to, to fight my shyness about, about being, uh, being lecturing in other situations. Just say something, but always try to say something. Always try to say something. Yes. Don't let the silence rule our resistance and our shyness. Um, so I mentioned Arlie Hauschild before and Strangers in Their Own Land. Uh, Hauschild is a very famous sociologist and what she's most famous for is for her work on emotion work and emotional labor. Um, Y'all got feelings, right? And you gotta kind of mold those feelings sometimes, right? Um, sometimes you need to put on a happy face, sometimes, you know all the time, right? You gotta manage that stuff. Not only your own, but other people's. Um, so how has my labor changed? I, I have to care more for the people around me. Um, my students come in more. My students always come in, right? I've talked about things being normal, um, but things becoming more normalized. My students come in more. Um, they're worried. And in thinking about my own, own emotional labor, I'm more worried. Um, when we talk about fascism and when we talk about violence I fear for myself and I fear for my family and I fear for my friends and I fear for all of you and so my labor is different to others and my own personal labor so take care of yourselves and take care of each other while you're doing the work <laughs>